Don't you love it? it? You become synonymous, kandarohi and crop circles. Don't you love it? Remember, every time you see a crop circle somewhere, it is a signal from kandarohi to his planet to come get him. Do you ever think why they don't come after so many crop circles? Something wrong. Maybe you've been signaling the wrong planet. What do you think? <laughs> oh, no, never mind. <laughs> oh, we talked about statues in general, didn't we? It was interspersed, so we don't need to talk about that, do we? No, we don't. Thank you. Okay, that one's out. Hmm. Okay, what do you guys want to talk about? There is uh, tankas, butter lamps, water offerings, precious materials used for statues, the art of black tea, precious gems and offerings, and ritual imp implements. What do you guys want to talk about? All of that is all related somehow. Come on, everybody uh, raise your hand for something or talk, huh? Ah, the ah uh, black tea. Okay, she says the ah uh, uh, black tea, and this one's banana lamps. Anything else? Sharon's like, I dare not talk because I'll be mimicked. <laughs> it's not that, sh it's, it's everything, it's just the mimic part she can't take. She's like, oh God, I wonder how I look if I'm mimicked because he's pretty good at this. <laughs> she'll, like, she'll, she'll, she'll <coughs> um, the art of black tea. There's no way you can get away with that one. Well, anything? Come on, what do you guys want to hear? I already talked about that. Can we talk about something I didn't talk about? Thank you. Go back to your, 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 your samadhi. Yes? Yes? Has a what? Mm -hmm. It does? Where? Well, then which one are you talking about? So what did you tell him? That Buddha's um, uh, pro-Hitler? Oh, you just tell him Buddha's pro-Hitler. Okay, Hitler's swastika is different than the Buddhist swastika. Okay, you have to understand, Hitler believed that the Aryan race was superior. He believed that the Tibetans are Aryans. And he liked the Tibetans very much. He respected them very much. And so what happens is, in ancient Indian society and in Tibetan society, Tibetan take their symbolism from India, mind you, the swastika, all right, not reversed, because what's his name? Uh, um, uh, Hitler's is reversed, is a sign of indestructibility, okay? And we usually make the sign of a swastika um, under our meditation seats. So when we do special retreats, we put that under there to invoke the blessings of indestructibility of the Buddhas. So when you have a swastika, it represents indestructibility. Why is the Buddha indestructible? Because the causes for destruction is gone. So the swastika was taken over by Hitler from the Eastern tradition, specifically Tibet, in order to show the might of his army of the Aryan race. He had very deep respect. I read many writings about him that he liked Tibet and all that stuff because to him it was mystery, it was wow, it was you know like Shambhala and all that stuff. And he, he kind of adopted that into his own kind of thinking. So his swastika was not something he made up. It was taken from the Eastern tradition, and it means indestructibility. But ours is a different type of swastika. It's cl a clockwise, right? That one, when they put on the Buddha, because Tibetans don't do that, but when it's put on the Buddha here in Chinese Mahayana, which I'm not too schooled on, it represents Buddha's mind being indestructible. It's a symbolism of that, all right? So what do we want to talk about? Anybody? Um, maybe one of the writers speak up because you were going to be all night voting. I heard that any repeats, you get a mala thrown at you. And if you repeat it again, you get the singing bowl <laughs> stick thrown at you. And I'm pretty accurate. You can ask some of my witnesses, yeah? <laughs> all right. That's very easy. That's a crop circle that he made last <laughs> week. <laughs> and let me translate it. Mm. 
Oh god, my pen ran out. Oh no. Okay, this is Kandarohi's latest um, um, uh, crop circle and translates as Rimchi driving me nuts. Take me back. So he's been using that lately to the, uh, you know, those people in the sky because I'm driving him nuts, but it didn't work. You like that? So we're going to use next week. You're running out of ideas. How about this? If, if you don't take me back, I am forced to have bloop with Andy. That might work. Yeah, exactly. Or oh, you can try something else. Please take me back. I bloop with Jivan. <laughs> now don't look in that direction because Jivan's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're sitting like a courtesan again. Stop it. Rasa, Rasa Devi. His name is Rasa Devi. That's what he wants to be called, Rasa Devi. And he, he's a reincarnation of a, a Rajasthani courtesan that was taken into the tent, and the last thing he saw was a hump of a camel, and that was it. He was savagely raped, and he enjoys that. Look at that. <laughs> you don't see, he's not crying. He's actually enjoying that uh, previous life memory that's coming back to him. So he's this beautiful courtesan, you know, of course Indian, they're beautiful, in Rajasthan in the desert. He was taken to a tent, and you know, there was about 20 of them. And they had, you know, turbans and the whole thing, and then the swords, and trust me, that was it for Rajas, Ra Rasa Devi. So the last thing he thought before, the last thing he saw before he, you know, swooned and died under unconsciousness was a, a hump of a camel. And here he is. In this life, if we could be so lucky, but never mind. Let's not go that far. That was pretty evil, wasn't it? Yes. All right. No object has intrinsic value. No object. No object has intrinsic value at all. The value we put on the object on this planet is based on some type of projected value or value that we believe it has value because of its rarity or certain qualities it has. Example, gold is more valuable than aluminum. Why? It's supposed to be more rare. So silver is more better than steel because it's more rare. So no object itself has any intrinsic value, meaning from its side it has some kind of value except the value we have placed on it. So for Mahasiddhas, whether you offer them gold or whether you offer them steel, to them it has no intrins intrinsic value. That's why they have no attachments to any physical things. People who have a lot of attachment, they are always operating on the basis of projections. They operate from projections to projections, out of projection, and within projection. So they're always operating with, within projection. And people who operate within projection a lot, they have a lot of miserly energy. Miserly energy, selfish energy, energy to save, to get, to hold, to touch, to have wealth is basically arising from people who do not believe that objects do not. They believe that objects have intrinsic value. Objects only have intrinsic value if our projections believe that. So people who meditate on what I just said and think about that clearly, they can cut their object of miserliness. They can be unmiserly. That's why you see very enlightened beings, or you see advanced beings, or you see kind beings of every race, national, gender, and background, and religious, um, uh, 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 religious background. They have no attachments to intrinsic or not. Uh, they have no attachments toward valuable things. You know, you'll see high lamas, they just spend their money like that. They wait to get it, they just spend it. Why? They don't attach any intrinsic value to it because they don't have no attachments. Then similarly, you'll see people who, if they have a little bit of money, they'll just put it away. They won't touch it. They won't do anything. They won't share. They won't do nothing. Why? They're very attached to it. Attachment to value, attachment to objects that you think have intrinsic value is a clear sign of a very miserly mind. Very, very miserly mind. That type of mind is very dangerous. Why? It affects their spiritual practice. It is very difficult for them to advance in spiritual practice. Why? Their miserly attachments will not only extend to material objects, it will extend emotionally, it will extend to time, it will extend to effort, it will extend to everything that will bring them to enlightenment. Everything. Anything that will bring them to enlightenment, they will be miserly about. And what they don't realize is the very cause of miserliness 
or the very cause of losing or not having is miserliness. So what happens is no object has intrinsic value on its own, no values. But that is, al that is on an ultimate level. On an ultimate level, no objects have intrinsic value. But on a relative level, objects have intrinsic uh, objects have value. Example, a US dollar is worth more than an Indonesian rupiah. You know, you want 10 US dollars or 10 rupiah. Thank you very much, dollars. But my point is, on a relative level, it has intrinsic value. So since our level of attainments and our level is on a samsaric level, which is relative, we operate on a relative level. So then we use relativity or we use relative objects to get to the absolute. So let me make it clear. Since we operate on a relative level, we use these objects to reach a absolute level. What does that mean? Gold and brass. This is brass, this is gold. It's exactly the same to an enlightened mind. But we are not enlightened. For us, we value this more. For this, we value this less. So since we value this less and we value this more, if we want to do spiritual objects to reach a mind of evenness and no attachment, we have to offer this and not this. Everybody understand that? Everybody understand that? You understand? Do you? Someone tell her. You tell her. Aha. Uh -huh. Mr. Big Mouth, go ahead. <laughs> Try. And if you if you if it's wrong, I ring a bell. Go ahead. Um, Just kidding. <laughs> Why? Very good. Why? No, 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 don't try to be mystical. Just say it from your heart. Why? Why is it more better to offer gold? Because we have attachment to its intrinsic value. Why? But if you're not detached and you keep giving away, it wouldn't create more attachment. If you are attached, then by giving away, doesn't it create more attachment instead of detachment? I have another question. So if it increases <laughs> attachment, how are you becoming detached by giving gold away, not brass? Can I have another question? <coughs> I love it. <laughs> it's a practice only if it helps you to become detached. But if you don't become detached, you become more attached. In fact, you become depressed once it's given away. How is that a practice? It's not a practice. It's torture. It's a mindset. Whose mindset? Okay, so how does a person overcome that? <laughs> All right. That was very good. Very good. See, it's not so easy being a Dharma teacher, huh? <laughs> Isn't a matter of listening to the information and then spitting it back forth to someone, is it? It's not that easy. If you practice, the information comes very easy. Why? When you practice, you talk from experience and practice, not from knowledge. See, if you simply listen to another person and talk about it, it doesn't help. You have to practice it. When you practice it, whatever angle you go from it, you can teach. Why? You're not teaching from no what you've heard. You're teaching from practice. So if, if someone describes to you what this looks like, you can only repeat. If you look at it and you talk about it, whatever angle is very easy. That's why it's very important for us to practice Dharma and not just listen and repeat. People who listen and repeat, their Dharma is hard and solid and it has no fluidity at all. We have to practice. Very good. Understand? No, you don't. You're just trying to say yes because you don't want any more attention, you little liar. <laughs> See? She's always lying, I'm telling you. All right. Now, because we... On a very simple level, because we, have, we pay more for gold than we would pay for aluminum. For us to pay for that gold, we have to have had that money. 
In order to have had that money, we must have had more blood, sweat, and tears, and efforts, and thinking. In order to have that blood, sweat, and tears, we must have had so much education. In order to have so much education, we must have invested that much time. In order to invest that much time, we must have sacrificed a lot of pleasure and happiness and good things in our life in order to have that money to buy that gold. So when we buy that gold, it is not just the intrinsic value or the, or the imputed intrinsic value, imputed intrinsic value of that gold that's creating the merit. It is also sacrifice behind it because on a relative level, people's thinking is I sacrifice, I educate, I don't go out, I don't have friends, and I go study, I have an education, and then I get a degree, and I get a good job, and I have a good money, and this money should buy me happiness, a car, a nice house, a relationship, good clothes, good food, I can travel, and I can be free. So people's view is on that. So when they buy something like gold, it doesn't directly benefit them when they offer it to Buddha, so they think it doesn't bring them happiness. Why? It doesn't bring them happiness, not because it doesn't, because they don't understand the effects and the practice and the workings of karma. So therefore, someone who spends this much time getting that much money, and they'll offer it to something that they don't get Direct benefit, direct benefit, a car, a house, a relationship, a money, you know, friends, a trip to, you know, to the south of uh, Tokyo, I don't know what. If they don't get that direct benefit and they spend that money, it shows you that they already have some kind of detachment to material objects practiced from previous lives. That's why we praise people who sponsor, we praise people who can sponsor, and sponsors themselves rejoice. Why? For a person to be able to sponsor shows you some degree of detachment. And that degree of detachment must come from a practice that comes from a previous life. And therefore, when people are able to donate a lot, and it isn't just money, it is time, it is effort, it is their education, it is their skills, and most important, their free luxury time. Because all of us has to work, all of us has to do things to sustain our life. And so when we are able to donate our free luxury time and we give that freely, to the Dharma, it shows you we are really committed to benefiting others. And how are we committed? Because we have actually studied, meditated, and listened, and thought about the benefits of benefiting others. And therefore, we're able to commit. Those who are not able to commit to the Dharma, donate to the Dharma, give time, or find time for it, those people, we can put them in a category that's not very pleasant, but very selfish. Very, very selfish. Why? They don't see the value and the benefit directly of benefiting others, so they prefer to do something else that they think has direct benefit. That's why. So they rather sleep instead of doing dharma. They rather make excuses than doing dharma. They rather go out instead of dharma. They rather have parties instead of dharma. They rather spend their money on boats and yachts and luxuries and houses and cars instead of dharma. They rather, they rather use their money to go on trips instead of dharma. They rather um, make excuses for not doing work instead of dharma. They rather say that they, they can't do it, they forgot, or, they, uh, or they, it's difficult for them instead of doing dharma. Why? Because these people are very, very latently, deeply selfish. And for many lifetimes, their practices, life after life after life, have supported this selfish attitude. So because many lifetimes are supporting this selfish attitude, this life, they're very easy to adapt towards selfishness, meaning not giving time to the Dharma, not improving themselves, not transforming themselves, not donating, not helping, not dedicating their lives to the Dharma or part of it to the Dharma. See, how much a person can dedicate towards Dharma is how unselfish they are. Why? The Dharma has no direct benefit for the person. has no direct benefit that you can see, but it has many benefits, but it has direct benefits for others. For someone who can work for no benefits and indirect benefits, it shows you the type of mind that they have. So a person who will go out on a date with someone gorgeous and they feel that brings them happiness and they, they say, oh, I'll, I won't do dharma, I won't write or something, it shows you the level of their mind. What's the level of their mind? They want direct benefit. And they fool themselves because there is no direct benefit in dharma, uh, I'm sorry, in samsara actions. None. None. It all leads to unhappiness. So people who have attachment towards wealth, time, skills, talents, and energy, if they have attachment towards that, it will manifest very clearly when they are asked to do something that has no direct benefit. Why? They'll be hesitant, they won't be good at it, they'll be lazy, and they'll find a hundred excuses of why they can't do it. 
and they'll always be late for it. They'll always forget about it. They'll have to be reminded. They have to be pushed. They have to be prodded to do anything of benefit to others. Why? Because they are latently extremely selfish. And if they're extremely selfish, what's the bad point about that? You, cannot, you can disassociate with them completely, but that will be the very cause of their destruction, their unhappiness, their loneliness, and their wandering and samsara. So you label them selfish, not to put them in a category that they're evil. You la label them selfish in a category of their samsara is that deep that they create more samsara within their samsara. Does everybody understand that? So therefore, those type of people we have a special compassion for, whether they can receive our compassion or not is a different situation. Whether they can receive or not, we have to keep trying. But whether they can receive or not is whether they're receptive and how much practice they've done. So therefore, people who can give their time for the Dharma and be effervescent for the Dharma and be awake for it and be alert for it and, and make their schedule for it and they turn their lives around for it and they donate to it, they give to it, they help to it in any way, shape, or form, they can do it. It shows you that they have developed some type of detachment from their previous lives. This detachment that they have developed will be the cause of future wealth. Spiritual and material. Listen to me carefully. This detachment that they have will be the cause of their future wealth. So people who feel, if I buy cars, if I buy women, if I buy diamonds, if I buy corals, if I buy sapphires, if I buy house, if I buy all these couture clothes, this will bring me happiness, but I'll just buy one silver bowl to offer to the center. The very cause for them not to have things has been put down. Why? Everything they bought and everything they've used is from samsara, and the one thing that brings them liberation is very small. Whereas people that say, no, I will donate to the Dharma. I will spend you know, this much for the Dharma, a whole set of bills, and I'll cut out on this. It shows you some kind of detachment. It shows you that they have realization of the value of this object towards the ultimate goal, happiness. And so this type of thought cannot arise like that. This type of detachment cannot arise just like that. This type of detachment must arise from practice. So these beings who are able to donate generously to the Dharma financially, donate generously their time. They don't make excuses for work and family and commitments and profession because those are all lies. Those are all lies. And they can give their time. They can give their money. They can give their energy. They can give their skills and talents to the Dharma. This shows you some level of attainments. Attainments of what? Detachment. What type of detachment? Not grasping towards objects that have no intrinsic value at all. Why? They have cut this imputation down to a lesser degree. Everybody understand? Good. You understood. Say it again, Kandarohi. Turn around and say it again. It's not blank at all. It's relaxed. You're happy. Those are words you, it evokes a distant memory. <coughs> oh, it does. No, no, you have other memories besides camels. Go ahead. <laughs> when you have detachment, your imputation of intrinsic value becomes less. Why? Either or cannot be both. Imputed means something that doesn't exist, but you feel it exists on some basis, but the bases are false. Therefore, when the bases are removed, the imputation is removed. So imputed value means that object doesn't have intrinsic value. That val intrinsic means something that is really has value. Gold actually doesn't have value. You can take gold and take it to some part of the world where there are jungles. They don't know anything about gold. Give it to them. They don't know. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, they, don't, they just want your head and shrink it. Right? I mean, that means that gold, gold, value of gold is intrinsic. But the value of life is, the value of gold is imputed. Imputed means it is only by our belief that it's valuable. But intrinsic value is life. Wherever you go, the loss of life is valued. You know, even killing an enemy, that's very valued. He lost his life, that's valuable. Or saving a life is valuable. So life is not imputed 
or I'm sorry, value of life is not intrinsic. It's not an imputed intrinsic object or phenomenon, but it is real from its own standing, from its own point of view. You understand? So therefore, therefore, if you take life, you go anywhere around the world, it's valued. Even in, in animals, if you try to kill them, they run because they value their lives. So this life is not, here it's valued, here it's not valued. Unlike gold, gold here is valued, but here it's not valued. You take it to a Mahasita, you give them gold, they just throw it into the forest. So that means gold value, the value of gold is not intrinsically valuable. It's only imputed. Imputed means it has no basis. So therefore, but if you go to a Mahasita and you want to kill somebody, he'll do everything he can or she can to stop you from killing because even to a Mahasita of an enlightened level, the value of that object is not imputed. It is intrinsic, meaning it arises from itself. Does everybody understand that? So when you have detachment, when you have detachment, that means you have some lesser percentage of imputed intrinsic value. So if you have less imputed intrinsic value, you're leaving samsara. Why? If you have less imputed intrinsic value or attachment to things, that means some basis for it has been removed. So if some basis has been removed, it becomes less. Then you remove it less, less. Then you finally remove it all, you become a Buddha. Does everybody understand that? So the art of generosity and the art of giving in Tibetan Buddhism or in Buddhism, the art of giving, the art of serkim, the art of offering, the art of the uh, bowls and silver and gold and the art of, of, of doing this and the art of generosity is based on having less imputed intrinsic value on phenomenon. Emptiness. Wonderful. One is necessity, one is extra. N necessity can be subjective, but the more you know Dharma, your subjective is toward enlightenment. So when your subjectivity is towards enlightenment, you don't have a problem anymore. So that can only come about by Dharma. Attend Rimchi's talks. Correct or not? So your wisdom and the wisdom of learning and contemplation and study will help you to break the wrong subjectivity. You go in. Go ahead, ask your other question. But did the first question's answer go in? It went in, but you don't like it because it's, it makes too much sense, I know. <laughs> I know exactly what you're thinking. Rats, you got me on that one. So you see, I didn't allow you room to be um, generous with yourself anymore. Now every time you buy another thing for yourself and not the Dharma, you feel guilty. Good. <laughs> I know why you don't like it. That's why you didn't say yes. I can read your mind. What's your next question, Mr. Accountant? No, I'm back go ahead. Go back. Go back as many times as you want. No, because detachment is state of mind, not your outer trappings. Example, Dalai Lama. Correct, correct. Luxuriously, yes, you can. But make sure you are living luxuriously from a detached state of mind, because if you're not and you're fooling yourself, you go to another plane of existence in your next life that's not so luxurious because you use up the very causes of your luxury in this life. You burn up the fuel. Correct. No, it's not a mindset. That's definitely not a mindset. That is wisdom and knowledge and contemplation that helps you 
to see the truth of phenomenon. What's the truth of phenomenon? The miserliness and grasping at imputed intrinsic values bring you samsara. Grasping at it, correct? Attitude comes from knowledge. Knowledge comes from understanding, but practice comes from it is part of you already. It is part of you. So it's not part of you, and you know that. You know that, but you're not practicing, and you have luxury. You still go to the three lower realms. If you're practicing that and you have luxury, you don't go to the three lower realms because you're not grasping at it. In fact, you use it to benefit others. Yes? So... Having luxury or not having luxury is not the word here. It is your grasping at its imputed intrinsic value. Come and be my friend. Come and be my friend. Please be my friend. And the point? What's the question if you want to push it to the end? I see you're struggling. Go ahead. You can't link the two of luxury life and detachment? Okay, let's get someone who... Okay, let's get someone who's not a Rimji to explain that to you to show you how stupid you are. Kandorohi? I love it. Could you keep your armpits to yourself? Thank you. I saw you waving at me already. Hi. Go ahead. No, it doesn't go blank. Just relax. You just start talking and it'll come to you. It's not blank at all. The last thing is your mind is blank. Trust me. No, no. The state of detachment and luxury and the connection. How to be luxurious and still be detached. That's what Mr. Richie Poo here is trying to say. He's filthy rich and he wants to keep his money and he wants to make sure he doesn't go to hell for keeping his money. That's what he's asking you, hello? And some more he wants to make more money. That's why he's an accountant. He's trying not to go to hell and keep his money. That's his question, hello? It's so simple. Now answer him and quit looking at his chest. <laughs> Stop staring at him. Stop undressing him with your evil big eyes. One more undressing from you, and you're going to get Jivan. <laughs> Pick Jivan or Fat Monk. <laughs> Fat Monk? <gasps> that is a slap on Jivan's face. He will see you behind the Krishna temple next week. That's it for you. All right. How does he keep the money? How does he have the cake and eat it too? It's so simple. Oh, my God. To you? Oh, to me. Yes. That's not bad. Elucidate on that. Not bad. Elucidate. Not bad at all. That's one way of looking at it. Come on, Kandorohi. You're our guru. We're your students, and we're, at, we're drowning here. Can you get the life raft out there? Help. Hey, by the way, how much money do you have <laughs> since we're talking about this? All right, go ahead. I want to see if I really want to be your friend or not, you know? Ah. Your wealth can be the cause of you retaining that wealth. Or your wealth can be the cause of you... Yes, and what's the difference? One word. Let him finish. You're being unfair. Just because he's gorgeous doesn't mean he's not allowed to talk. Go ahead. Detachment. Attachment, why? Oh. 
Correct. Correct. And that's what you're doing right now. You keep it hoping to get more and it doesn't go away. It is. That's what you're doing. That's why we're in samsara because all of us do that. Exactly. Bingo. The penny dropped. You trapped yourself, I know. Exactly. That's what you're doing right now. Because by keeping it and by thinking it brings you so much happiness and not doing anything with it of value except keeping it and entertaining yourself, you create the very causes for you to lose it because of your attachment. Exactly. Exactly. Very good. I know that's not what you're driving at, but that's the truth that, that, that you don't want to hear. I know that's not what you're driving at. Exactly. What are you driving at? How to keep the money and not go to hell too. I know. But it doesn't work like that. Now, the second point you think you're driving at is how to keep it and not go to hell. Then what is it? What's left? Oh, that's so simple. That is so simple. That is incredibly simple. If you have 20 kids and you live with your in-laws and you have to buy a house that has 20 rooms, is it because you want it or because you're providing it for others? Now you tell me. If you have 20 kids and your in-laws and your parents and, and you, know, you need 20 bedrooms, is it because you want it or there's a need? Let me finish. You be fair. You answer my question now. Now you be fair. Don't be tricky. So if I'm getting that kind of house not because I want it, that there's a need, is that attachment or necessity? So does that create negative karma? Okay. So if I have wealth, if I have wealth, and an example, if I have wealth and I have to look wealthy because I'm generating funds for the Dharma, because I have to approach more wealthy people, and I'm keeping that for the sake of promoting Dharma, is that bad karma? Then can't you keep your luxury and be detached? Okay. So what's your problem now? That's only one motivation. There's many. What's your problem? So therefore, someone like the Dalai Lama has incredible wealth, but they're detached because they have this karma to receive it by giving away, and whatever they receive, they just give, they just give, they just give. They never run out because they create the causes to keep getting. So the causes of getting wealth is not keeping, it is to give. And if we're keeping, it is to receive to be a more benefit to others. Do you understand? If you don't ask. What are you trying to say? Just say it. You're holding us up here. <laughs> Just say it. Why? Don't go around the bush. Just say it, even if it's embarrassing. Just say it. Yes. Yes. Then you're not detached fully. You're just partially detached. So you get the karma being partially detached. Simple. It's a percentage game here. There is no balance because as long as you're attached, you can't be enlightened. There is no balance. How could you be greedy and detached at the same time? They're opposite ends. There is no balance. But if you become detached, you can live in luxury and gain luxury life after life after life without it being a cause for you to be not luxurious. Why? Because you're living in detachment. And therefore, when you live luxuriously or not luxuriously, the purpose of it is not self-gratification. The purpose of it is higher. Be clear. Think, think, think. Mm, no. Do you understand why it cannot balance? Why? Tell me. There's some black and there's some white. It's very good. See, accountants aren't stupid. <laughs> very good. Your questions never end. That's why you're in samsara and I'm here.
let's. Okay. Mm. Yeah. My question is how to change one factor. Oh, that's so simple. You just look at the environment, the situation, and the need. Example, if you come from a royal family, you catch to have a wooden house, it ruins the reputation, you, it, you won't be effective in your social and charity work and others. You have to give a view, you have to give a look that you look all right. So if you don't care about that, if you're just a, you live in a forest in, and you can get, get a, a wooden house, it's fine. That's situational. Balance doesn't come from a motivation. Balance comes from the situation, the time, the place, and how much benefit it will bring or not bring. And at our level, there's always some level of disbenefit because we are not totally detached. But in the process of becoming detached, we're practicing to become detached. So at our level, me and you, we can never do anything that's free of detachment yet. But to aspire and to work towards that, we can be. And that's better than a normal person who doesn't even think about that. So detach detachment is not not having. Detachment is having or not having dependent on situation. You get that? Oh, good. Did, did it click? Oh, good. Now you're my student. Yes? Oh, you just burped. Do you want a cot to lie on? You look awfully uncomfortable. Go ahead. Of course. That's what I just said in a nutshell. Of course. Of course. But that there is no need and you justify it with the need so that you can it be an extension of your attachment, then that's not very detached, is it? To justify it with uh, stupid little reasons. then that's not detachment, that's attachment. So for people who have wealth and people who live in wealth, who can acquire wealth, it's extremely dangerous. It may be glamorous and nice and beautiful at this moment, but it's extremely dangerous because if your mind is not practiced, it can be the very cause of you to reach very, very lower depths of samsara, also in this life. Why? You may have a lot of money around you. It doesn't mean you're happy, not depressed, dependent on some substance, being used, feeling empty, feeling lonely, suicide, doesn't mean anything. In fact, if you look at a lot of people, more ratio of famous, beautiful, rich, powerful people who commit suicide than poverty-stricken people. I'll tell you why. Some superstars, my theory, some superstars like Aliyah and all that, who at 23, they become superstars, powerful, wonderful overnight, they die suddenly. Why? Their merit ran out. If they had not become that, their, their, I'm sorry, their karma ran out. If they had not become that, their karma would have lasted a lifetime. But because they used that karma, all their investment into one department, fame, and all the praise, and everybody thought wonderful, and money is used up immediately, they die. Why? Karma is used up. That's my theory. So if you look at more powerful people, rich people, and beautiful people. In fact, there's more cases of depression among people who are very beautiful and attractive than those who are not. Why? In order to have that, they have to use some part of their karma. And it drains their karma bank to have that. So they may have the beauty, but not the happiness that comes with it. So we have to be very careful when we don't have that knowledge. Did that hit something? Good. I knew it would. Stick around. I'll bring you to Kachara sooner or later. <laughs> I like this bell. I feel so chugim chungba. He used to do that. That's right. So we don't want to drain our karma bank on useless, stupid, ridiculous things that will take away from other parts of our life. Or we don't want to do that because the fall can be sudden and instant. Sudden and instant. And therefore you hear about these people who take tremendous precautions to lose, to keep their wealth and all of a sudden overnight they lose everything. They commit suicide. The crash that came, how many people in Thailand became rickshaw drivers and just died and committed suicide, I read in the paper when I was in Malaysia. And there are people who care nothing about their wealth. They don't care nothing about any, all of a sudden they just get all this inheritance, they get all this money, someone gives them, they win the lottery, they're instant millionaires overnight. 
What is that? Oh, is that God? No, that's, that's karma. That is karma. So if we use up our merit, if we use up our karma bank and we don't distribute that around well, so if we have this amount of money, we don't pay our bills, our telephone, our car, our house, electricity, utilities, you know, we don't distribute it and we spend everything on just party Then everything else, they shut down our house, the bank takes away our car, electricity and water doesn't work. So something like that. People who use up their karma bank very fast and they end up nowhere. Why? If we want to do dharma work, people think if I simply do dharma work and I have a motivation to work and therefore I, it's dharma. So I work, 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 work to make money for dharma, but they don't replenish that, mer that, they don't replenish that karma. They don't be successful in work. Also, they don't be successful in dharma. They end up nowhere. Why? Their karma bank is exhausted. Why? You don't create karma. You don't simply just create karma just by motivation. No, it's not that simple. Because in order to just do dharma work, listen carefully, in order just to do dharma work and no practice, no commitments, no samayas, no tok, nothing, in order to do just dharma work, meaning you work with the motivation dharma, it means that you have reached a certain level already, that you don't have to do any practices to support your merit bank to increase to do work. And that is impossible. No one in this room is at that level. No one. So for us not to do meditations and practices, for us not to do um, um, our sadhanas and for us to do um, uh, preliminary practices to purify our karma, to collect merit so that we can do work to bring benefit to the dharma. There's no one in that room that's possible. No one. And that's what we heard last week on the book. That's what we heard in the last book teachings by Tenzin Palmo, who says we have to breathe in in order to breathe out. So if we do our practices and we do our sadhanas and we do our commitments and we have guru devotion, especially in the tantric path, and we do all that, and then the second part of our, the second part of our day, we use it to work in office, in you know, construction, whatever for the dharma, it has a double result. But if we don't do anything, we don't breathe in, we can't breathe out. So if we don't do our committed practices and our merits and our purification practices, even when we're doing so-called work for the dharma, it won't reach a fruition and in fact we get burned out. Why? Because our motivation and attainment is not that strong enough to support that on its own without meditative and contemplative practices. So people who use the excuse of, I'm doing dharma work, because I've seen some monks in a monastery, very rare, who just cook, or just clean, or they just drive, and they say, I'm serving the sangha, but they don't want to meditate, they don't want to attend dharma talks, they don't want to attend pujas, they don't want to attend commitments, they don't want to attend teachings. There are monks like that, rare, but there are. And they say, because I'm already working for the sangha, I'm collecting merit. After a while, you see them disrobe. Why? It's not because what they're doing is bad, because they didn't collect the merits to remain a monk. They didn't collect the merits to even sustain in serving the Sangha. Their merits ran out. Oh, they are like that. How can you serve the Sangha and become disrobed? But then you see monks who in the mornings, they meditate, they contemplate, they do prostrations, they do mandala offerings, they do their sadhanas, they do retreats, but in the second half of the day, they teach, or they go out and work in the fields, or they go and serve their gurus, or they take care of monastic guests, and those monks last and last and last and last. Because why? Half of the day or part of the day they're spending toward contemplative and meditative and sadhanic practices to collect the merit. The other half, they're actually serving the Sangha directly. It's balanced. So if we sit here in Kachara Media and Publications or in Kachara House saying, well, I'm working here and I'm supporting the Dharma, I'm helping Dharma, you know, I write for the Dharma and I'm on the computer for the Dharma and I'm editing for the Dharma, I work in one of the Dharma stores, and that's Dharma what? And we don't want to meditate? and we don't want to do our sadhana, and we don't want to do tok, and we don't want to listen to dharma, and we don't want to read, and we don't want to study, we don't want to do retreats, you will burn out. And your work will bring no results. Your work will bring no results, and you will burn out. Why? You don't have the karma to last that long. So people who do dharma work are especially even more important to do contemplative and meditative practices. Why? Then you get double. So people who refuse to keep their commitments, refuse to do their sadhanas, very basic sadhanas, ref that is a direct violation to guru devotion. Direct. When you stop your sadhanas with any excuse, it's a direct violation to guru devotion, to your gurus who gave you the practices. A direct violation. Direct. No and, if, and buts, no excuses, no lame cover-ups. You are directly violating your guru. So if you say you're working for the dharma, but you're violating your guru, the amount of merit you collect from working for the dharma in whatever job you're doing is become nothing because the negative karma you get from violating your guru cancels all of that out. What's the point? 
So someone says, hey, you know, I, I, I open up McDonald's and all the money that I get, which is a pretty bad example, okay, I open up a vegetarian shop, you know, selling vegetarian food so that all this will go for, the, for my guru and his work. All this will go for Gandhian Monastery. And I'm not going to do any meditations. I'm not going to do any practice. I'm not going to do any sadhana. I'm not going to do anything because this is supporting my guru. This will help. And we don't do anything and we just do that. It won't work. It will not work because in order to have such an incredible advantage to serve our guru, in order to have the merit to serve Gandhin, we have to have merits to even serve such a great institution. Why? If you have the merits, you don't have to make offerings to the statue and pictures of the Buddha. You can visualize, you can see them directly and make offerings. Why can we not see them directly? So that's why we make offerings to the statues and tanka so that we can collect the merits in order to see them directly to make offerings to them directly. So similarly, people who say, hey, I do work in order to help the Dharma, they get up nowhere, they end up nowhere. Why? If your teacher tells this and you do the opposite, especially if you're in the tantric path, you get no result. Why do you get no result? You are in direct violation to your guru. Why? The broken guru samaya will override any merit that you collect from doing any type of so-called Dharma work. And people don't understand that. People who don't listen to Dharma, engage in Dharma, read Dharma, meditate and contemplate on Dharma will not understand that. Whereas people who do uncontemplative practices, sadhanic practice, sadhanas, and commitments and rituals, and they do pujas, you know, they're committed pujas. They do that and they do the Dharma work, you see them grow. Why? They collect the merit to be able to do something so great as to support their guru, the growth of the Dharma, and Gandhin. I'll give you an example. If you want to serve His Excellency Mahathir, do you think that you can just get out of school and just jump into his office and say, I'm going to be your personal secretary? Oh, no. If you want to serve His Excellency, the ex-Prime Minister Mahathir, be his per personal secretary, do you think you can just jump out of secretarial school and just jump into his office and say, hey, I want to be your secretary? No way. You've got to go through years of experience. You have to build your portfolio. You have to know the right people. You have to, at the same time, uh, or correct time, correct juncture, and maybe you can be somewhere in his office. And then maybe in this slide, maybe one out of a billion chance, you can have the honor and the, to be his private secretary to help a nation to grow. Just jump out of secretary school. I'll be that ridiculous. That's stupid students who say, hey, I'm not going to do any Dharma practice. I'm not going to do any of my sadhanas. I'm going to do any retreats. I'm not going to do any of that because I'm doing Dharma work. I'm doing Dharma work, and that Dharma work collects the merits, and my motivation is my guru. Wrong. You can listen to the Dharma tape. Even last week, we listened to the Dharma tape together. Tenzin Pamo, she said that. That's in the Kachi tradition. Same thing. Exactly the same what I'm talking about. Don't think this is something Temurimji made up. No. Well, so then, oh, you know, um, well, I know a little bit of Dharma. I'm not going to do any practice. I'm not going to do my sadhana. I'm going to do my commitments. Well, you know, because I don't have to do it, even though my guru told me, because I'm already doing this work to support my guru. Wrong thought, wrong motivation. For you to even have the merit to support your guru or support Gandhin, you have to have the merit first. Just like we make offerings to a tanka or a statue first before we make offerings to the real Buddha. So that's why people who really want to do offerings and who want to, to take care of the Dharma, they have to hold their commitments even more than normal people. And for them to make excuses that they don't have time to hold their commitments, it's absolutely wrong view. Why? I look at Ken Surimchi, who has to teach thousands of monks every year, who produces many, many geshis every year, who is one of the most elite masters of Tibetan Buddhism alive today, Ken Surimchi himself, in Gandhian Monastery. And just because he has to teach more, just because he has a heavier schedule, just because he has a heavier itinerary, he never cuts down on his sadhana. In fact, he went for audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama graced Gandhian Monastery and came down there, and we had audience. And Ken Sirimchi had audience with us. Irene was with me. She took the picture for us. And when Ken Sirimchi said, I would like to do a retreat, three-year, three-month, three-day Yamataka retreat, which is 100 million mantras, May I please be excused from teaching and, and uh, participating in monastic affairs for three years, three months, three days, Your Holiness? Of course, everybody says yes. His Holiness said no. You will do your retreat and keep up your teaching schedule and do your sadhanas. And Ken Srimji said, yes, Your Holiness. And for three years, three months, and three days, I observed my guru who lived upstairs. I served him. I cooked for him. I cleaned for him. I did his laundry. Do you know that? He taught a full class every day, four to five classes per day. And... He did six to seven hours of his personal sadhanas. And he did about seven to eight hours of Yamataka practice per day.
and he did that for three years, three months, and three days. And when he finished 100 million Yamantaka mantras, and he graduated a few Geshis, and he did the fire puja, then he went back to his holiness and reported, I finished. And you know what his holiness said? Very good. Okay, that's it. No praise, no pat on the back, nothing. I saw this. So for people who tell me here, oh, I'm going to do work, and therefore I can't be involved in, in the Dharma. I'm going to do work, and therefore I can't be involved in Dharma work. I can't do this, I can't do that. It is their own self-cherishing mind, and their selfish attitude, and their lack of knowledge, and their habituation that push them away from actual Dharma. And their lack of knowledge. They actually speak from ignorance. Therefore, no benefit.